How's that? Um, yeah, so my name is Jeremy Mendy, and um, I'm a, I'm a um, sort of someone who's sort of searching for description, I suppose, about what I do. Um, I come from a, a design background, um, and I guess traditionally people would sort of think about that as a graphic design background. But I find as my career is kind of progressing and my interests are growing, I'm sort of moving, I think, a sort of bit further away from that. Um, the talk I'm going to give is called The Social Mirror, and I'm going to focus on a couple projects that I've been involved in over the last two years that I think sort of attack this idea of uh, how we see ourselves showing us back to ourselves um, in our kind of cultural reflections. Um, but maybe um, the first couple notes. So I, I run a studio in San Francisco called Mendy Design, and um, we do a lot of different things. Um, I think uh, what we're really looking for is how to capture or how to create interpretive experiences, um, how to give people the opportunity to make sense of things for themselves. And so that might be in a, a print publication. Um, it might be in the way we uh, create a kind of online uh, interactive opportunity. Um, back when people used to print things, uh, we made a lot of things that were really about creating these sort of very intense visual experiences or things that allowed you to uh, find your way through a piece and kind of make sense of it on your own terms. Uh, we collaborate a lot with architects and um, this was a collaboration with a group called Public Architecture. It's, it's, a, it's a proposal for a day labor station. And we worked on the skin and the signage and that sort of thing. And the idea was to create something that was kind of a provocation, something that uh, illuminated the idea of um, immigration, politics, economics, and how a building and a, uh, a communicative sort of visual skin might sort of make that uh, a conversation for that community. Um, so I don't think anyone knows what they were doing at this time. No? Uh, it's, it's not surprising. No, nope. Every time I give this lecture, no one knows. Um, it's exactly the moment that Deepwater Horizon exploded and sunk into the Gulf of Mexico. And I remember uh, I was in California when this happened, and I thought, okay, you know what? This is going to be one of those moments that's going to wake people up. It's going to be... Um, impossible for us to ignore the kind of consumptive culture that we've created. And um, surely there will be a kind of, um, you know, uh, grassroots movement after this to kind of make some significant cultural change to um, suggest new directions for ourselves. And, um, you know, of course that didn't happen. It was, it was an event, it was a disaster. It was of the class of disasters that I think we're getting, unfortunately, more and more used to. And I suppose this could have been a picture of Katrina, or it could have been um, an image of sort of the economic disparity that we are sort of very, or understand is sort of part of our world. And it made me start thinking about um, the, the less uh, attractive elements of our culture, the idea of how we're caught between these poles, I think, in a contemporary existence, the idea of self versus society, or the idea of um, uh, indulgence versus sacrifice, or, or engagement versus escape. And I started to think about this kind of me culture, and, and how much do we choose to engage with that, and how much do we choose to sort of ignore that in the way we go about our daily lives. Um, and I, I wanted to, or I guess maybe that's what I mean when I say this idea of the social mirror, creating something that forces us to sort of look at ourselves, or look at our reaction to things, or look at the way we choose not to react to things. Um, and so the couple projects I'm going to talk about our different looks at this idea of, of the social mirror. So in 2010 and 11, I was a fellow at the American Academy in Rome, and um, I kind of took this idea to Rome to work on and think about how would I create a social mirror? How would I create a project that sort of 
you know, could, you could scale it to enough of a size that it could create or, or have the potential to create some sort of impact or some sort of ripple. And um, the designer in me, the, the uh, visual designer in me, you know, Rome is sort of fascinating because you're, you're hard pressed to find a city in the world where it has so many surfaces of communication. So wherever you go, there's inscriptions and, and messages, whether you can read them or not. Um, you know, the ancient world, um, the, the beginning of the modern world, um, and really the momentary world, the idea that even down to the scale of the street, there is this series of inscriptions that kind of coats the city. And my, I, I sort of took this as an opportunity to think, okay, well, you know, maybe that's a stage I can work with, or maybe that's a platform I can start to um, enliven with, with some sort of interpretive experience. And, you know, I, I think I started the way that I typically would start any project, which is what's the graphic language? What's the, the, what are the words? What are the pictures? How do I get something that's going to create or, or um, provoke a kind of dialogue uh, for, a, for a viewer, someone walking down the street? And so, I, you know, I, I worked um, sort of intuitively, and I, I was writing, I was creating collages and images, and I would print these things up in a small edition, and I would put them out on the street and just sort of watch, watch what would happen. And I worked, you know, in this manner. Um, I worked much more graphically, intensely, you know, this idea of these kind of richly layered symbolic surfaces. Um, and I worked also, in a way, just trying to make an image that someone would look at. You know, because you know, like shock as a tool. And what I think is interesting is no one looks at this stuff. You know, if you think about your own way through the city, we have these kind of thick layers of, um, of uh, uh, protection so that we don't um, confront things that might slow us down or distract us from what we're thinking about. And so that was sort of a big lesson in and of itself that... Uh, my desires to create these richly textured visual languages really don't work in that kind of an environment. Um, so having done um, this, this work, um, I produced a project which it, 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 the media in Rome called it Il Bianchi Manifesti, which means um, the white posters or the white manifesto, which is the, the title I prefer. And it was really a very simple idea um, to insert something in the city that would be provocative of mental images. Something that um, uh, was a bit of a trigger for thought, for the idea that pictures would start to happen. Uh, something really oblique and totally without context. Something that uh, just hung there in space and refused to really give anything of itself away. And something that you would see over and over again as you went through the city. Um, each time you saw it, it was sort of a reminder that maybe you had chosen to ignore it before. But when you saw it again, could you choose to ignore it again? And so um, I convinced the Comune di Roma, the city government, to give me a thousand of these kiosks throughout the city. And um, I, I produced this project. And it was up for 30 days. And um, it was kind of fascinating how it lit up the kind of culture blogs. And you could go to places and hear people talking about it, questioning it. Um, offering their own interpretations of it. And the, the beginnings of the project really began with um, futurism and futurist poetry and the idea how the futurist poets of you know the beginning of the 1900s thought about what the future was going to be like. And it was going to be this technological place that was going to be founded on industrial power and gasoline and it was going to be the, the beauty of, of an industrialized landscape where we'd merge more and more with technology until we were these man-machine hybrids. And it was a hopeful, beautiful place. And I wondered, a hundred years after the Futurist Manifesto, whether we thought the same thing. 
about these very same ideas that seem to sort of motivate uh, the forward lean of our contemporary culture. Uh, and so the themes and the words really came from looking at, at futures poetry and, um, you know, ideas about what will the future look like? What is authority? What is truth? Um, how much time do we have left? Um, should we be taking this low-grade awareness of a world in change, in massive change, and should we be taking it more seriously, or is it just a kind of panic, as opposed to maybe a real panic? Um, I want it to be physical. I want it to be something that you couldn't easily ignore. It's, it's not something that you could, you know, kind of wipe away on your phone if you didn't want to think about it anymore. And so that's why the physical presence of it was important. Um, but as I was getting ready to produce it, I thought, you know, I'd really like to be able to capture the dialogue that this generates within the city. And I thought, how would you do that? Because the minute you put a URL or a QR code or something like that on the posters, they become secondary to something else and they become advertising or they become um, just a, a kind of secondary support for some larger idea. So I didn't want to do that. I knew that would kind of ruin the, the odd energy of it. And so what I ended up doing was I bought the ad words for all the um, phrases. And so uh, if you had an IP address in Rome and you Googled the phrases, it would take you to these ads. And if you clicked on the ads, it would take you to a website. And the website was... Um, it sort of talked a little bit about the philosophy of the project and the intention of it, but it was really a way to capture the dialogue that was happening at that time. And I think in, it got about 20,000 hits in 30 days, and um, I think we recorded about 800 different comments. And you can imagine that the comments you know, were sort of all over the map, sort of spanned the gamut of possibility, but in general they fell into three categories. Um, fear, hope, and um, probably the one which I found, um, this is when my notes have been really great because I can't speak Italian, uh, but I know what this is. Um, this one is one of resignation. It says, it says the few, we can't change, we're resigned to the way things are, human nature has locked us into a particular way of being, and the only way that will change is if disaster comes. And I thought that that was the scariest outcome, that there was this kind of resigned hopelessness to uh, a, kind of, a kind of decay. And I think one of the aspects of the project was how many of us sort of are sort of giving in to that idea, as opposed to maybe thinking that there's a way to be proactive. Um, so when I was w wrapping up that project, um, I took away a few things, and, and one of them was that as soon as the project sort of faded from the event horizon of what was right in front of people, the dialogue fades, the ideas go away, um, it doesn't really leave a lasting impression. And I wondered how one might make a social mirror that had more teeth, that, that was something that uh, it was maybe the potential for personal meaning was so great that behavioral change would be something that um, would fall out of it. And so the next project, um, which uh, is called Narcissus, it was really sort of an experiment. And um, it, I produced this at the Headland Center for the Arts um, last year in 2012. And I was interested in a number of things. So. Um, this is what's called natural bitumen. It's um, low-grade petroleum that's just a byproduct of the Earth's biologic and um, seismic activity. And uh, it, it's just cheap, natural petroleum. And I think working it on, you know, as a graphic designer, working in paper or working on a screen, the idea that there's material, materiality that has a message or a communicative potential to it is something that fascinated me. Um, and then the other thing is that it's based on carbon. It's, um, you know, petroleum, it's, it's a carbon-based product, and uh, life is a carbon-based product. 
we are carbon-based uh, beings. And the idea that there was this sort of circularity between who we are or our organic sense and then the fuel we burn to power our world and to poison our world has that same molecular DNA is something that I found very interesting. Um, and I, I was looking for a way to locate you directly in the piece itself. So what, what are ways that I can um, take a kind of real-time signature of a viewer, a visitor, a user, and, and put them right in the environment? So the idea was to capture biometric data, heart rate data, and to use that as a, um, the, the driver, the generator of the experience. So you are generating the piece as you, as you experience it. Um, and so the way it worked was you walked into a, a kind of ante room and you um, were confronted by a balance. And in perfect equilibrium, there is on one side a tray of, of spent petroleum, so it's this black, um, highly reflective, dirty liquid, uh, which has an odor to it. And then on the right is this canary, and the two are sort of are in sort of perfect balance or equilibrium. And to get to the larger installation, you have to kind of navigate around this thing. As you move around it, it moves. It, 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 it changes based on the uh, movement. And sometimes the petroleum will spill, and I was mixing it with charcoal to create drawings like the one you see on the wall over there. And as you walk into the next part of the installation, it's, it's dark, and so it's been shielded from the light, and you're, you're fitted with a biometric sensor which fits to your ear, and it has a, um, a wireless radio um, which communicates to an array of computers. And you approach a, a 20 foot long um, table that's filled with 26 gallons of petroleum. So the odor in the room is apparent and it becomes this kind of odd, reflective, perfectly reflective surface. And on the top of the surface are animations that are driven in cadence with your heart rate. So what, what you hear over a PA system is your heartbeat. What you see are animations that pulse in time with your biometric rhythm. And over time, they reveal phrases to you through the way the animations work. Um, and so I think I have a video here.
So people found the experience really disarming. Uh, the idea that I, I think people felt really exposed. Um, hearing your heart rate and seeing it represented in front of you at the same cadence creates a sort of strange uh, awareness of the fragility of life, of your life. And um, to be communicated to in that frame of mind, in that sort of vulnerable place, made the messaging feel, or people kept asking me, how does it know me? How does it know this about me? And so there was this sort of strange prophecy that people read, like this was a sort of strange kind of oracle that was somehow telling them something internal that was coming generated from their body. And, um, you know, maybe in conclusion, there were sort of two uh, mythic figures or, or mythic uh, myths that motivated the piece, the idea of Narcissus, the idea of the, the reflection that's so seductive that we can't look away. Um, I think technology now creates these very seductive reflections of ourselves, and I think we're all too good at looking at them. Um, and then the oracle, um, the, the ability to prophesy, the ability to sort of speak about the future in a way that's believable. And it's interesting, the oracle at, at Delphi, the thinking, or the representation, the thinking is that the oracle at Delphi was right over a rift in the earth that had this... Um, uh, mineral fumes that came out of it that kept the oracle kind of high. Um, and so she would reach these ecstatic states. And so the idea of this petroleum bath, which has that same sort of fume-like quality, was sort of referencing these two ideas. Um, and so I think for me, that I'm interested in this idea of these reflective experiences so that they create an opportunity for us to maybe forget the ego defenses that we have and to remind us of our sort of organic roots, our biologic roots, and who are we and what is the world we want for ourselves when we make that realization as opposed to a much more sort of culturally learned, socialized understanding of the future. Um, so that's, that's what I've been doing. Thank you.